Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Bounty episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre with me as Z. Apologies that we didn't get any episodes out last week. Uh, I had some family stuff going on already, so we were going to be recording a bit later than we'd like to. But then I also got sick again, so that was awesome. Pretty much like the whole week disappeared. But yeah, because of that, we have some more packed episodes for this week, including the topics that we would have covered last week, which it was funny because Z started doing the prep streams and... So he, he ended up doing, like, two prep streams for this episode. So, you know, that makes it super special. Yeah, I finally um, finally got in there and actually, you know, sh- streamed one of these uh, preparation streams that I've talked about doing for quite a while. Finally do it, and we don't even run the episode where I did it for. Yeah. So, yeah, ended up doing two of those. And those don't have, like, a fixed time. I may settle on a fixed time to do those streams, although if anybody kind of has opinions on when you'd like to see that sort of stream, or if you care to, you know, feel free to let me know if you prefer, like, Monday, fr- or probably not on Mondays, actually, but Friday, it's probably going to be on Friday or Saturday. I've been doing them in the evenings. I'm not opposed to maybe doing them earlier, though, on, like, you know, Saturday early afternoon or something been another time slot that could work but if anybody has strong opinions or just the desire for it to be accessible at a time you're around feel free to let me know on discord it's pretty different from how we were running the podcast live where we had to stick to trying to keep the audio clean so you're able to you were able to interact with chat a lot more people were asking questions that weren't necessarily relevant to the topics that you were gathering but are sort of tangentially related and there were some interesting discussions that came out of that. So I, I think it is cool to check out if, if some of you haven't, uh, you know, it might be something to do on, especially on the weekend. Yeah. It's just like a casual, you know, chill stream. So yeah, people can like interrupt. Them. And while nobody has claimed it, the beep point of redemption has been available for these. I will, I will no. be the first. <laughs> you I, I don't need sure. to keep the audio clean, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's something that Z has been doing, and you get to see a bit of the behind the scenes too. You get to see like uh, how we put topics together with the scheduler and all the feeds that he goes through. Like I remember a few people had asked you what feeds you had and if you had some of this stuff public, and uh, they were appreciative that you're able to pass that over. So yeah, you get kind of a uh, some insight onto that side of it too. Very exciting so, stuff. <laughs> very exciting. Yeah, not not dry. But yeah, so uh, like I said, we do have a lot of topics and shout outs here, so we'll jump into it. Up first, I do want to talk about CCC a little bit since we didn't get a chance last week. Uh, we said we'd shout out some talks we found interesting from 37C3 after getting a chance to watch some. And then, yeah, we didn't put out any episodes last week. Since then, I've had a chance to listen to some. And while many of them are more suited to topics we talk about on the Binary podcast, so I will talk about CCC again on that one, there was a two that I wanted to give a shout out here as well. One of them I haven't completely gone through yet, but it seems pretty funny and covers the sorts of issues we'd cover on Bounty episodes, and that's called Writing Secure Software. And the presenter, Fifi, he goes through a bit of mocking on the security industry with all these like security solutions and all of the insane marketing. <laughs> there was some funny bits in, in that, but and many of them were in products that we cover a lot on the podcast for vulnerability so uh i was getting a bit of a chuckle from that but it talks about how he actually tackles developing a somewhat complex web app and the steps that he takes i didn't fully agree with all of his takes but it is an entertaining talk the other one that i wanted to give a mention was fuzz everything everywhere all at once now it is a fuzzing talk so a lot of it is more binary focused however about halfway through they do touch on catching some higher level issues with fuzzing as well primarily injection type issues and the way that that works is what they're talking about is their lib afl and uh kimu specifically with emulation and because of their setup they're able to do like jit instrumentation and with that like JIT level hooks and stuff that they're able to do. They talk about trying to catch like SQL injections, LDAP injections, things like that. And I thought that was really cool. And I think that could be an interesting area to explore for bounty researchers too. So I did want to give that a shout. But yeah, as I said previously, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, at the risk of uh, perhaps spoiling some of that, how were they trying to catch it? Like, were they just doing a whole, like if the syntax breaks, then they consider it an injection or did they have something more complex on it? Sort of, yeah. So they basically set up some hooks on 
like using source to sync terminology on the sinks and basically trying to see if certain characters from an attack input could make its way that far oh, and then okay. like crashing on that so yeah it, it was somewhat like i think it's still somewhat early like they're just kind of exploring it but i thought it was a cool idea and it's it is something that i haven't really seen talked about before so the whole idea I, I figured of trying that would to be interesting for for the bounty podcast too yeah the whole idea of trying to fuzz for like those higher level issues i think is going to be an important area of research like fuzzing on the web is feels a lot more immature than what we get with binary stuff because we're very lacking on the de- on that detection side so it is interesting here somebody kind of trying something a little bit different because the one main technique that i'm familiar with is doing that where if the syntax of a query breaks then it likely is the case that fuzz prem or fuzz content made it in and that's kind of how they do the detection but like we do need some other ways to detect other issues too so interesting here that people are doing some work there unfortunately i didn't remember to actually get through on any of the talk there are a couple that i am interested in taking a look at the breaking drm and polish trains i've seen that hit the news a bunch apparently a company was basically saying like if the train detects that it's been sitting around for a while and it's not at one of their like approved workshop locations then it was probably being worked on and therefore they would like brick their own train and make it not work and then there was the Tetra stuff. All cops are broadcasting, talking about these recent Tetra vulnerabilities. So the encryption being used on like police uh, radio broadcasts. I think, I'm not sure about the region on that, actually. I want to say US, but either way, it sounded interesting, but I haven't had a chance to look at it. But yeah, I just want to at least call those out. They were in, They seemed interesting to me, but like I said haven't listened yet so i can't actually say they're great watches i do still want to do like a watch party for the ccc talks where they are you know that we've done them before so and hardware uh, io and defcon yeah i mean we have a backlog <laughs> but, you know we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. make progress we'll get there uh, we'll maybe so, get yeah, to maybe hardware can... before the next hardware <laughs> maybe. um but yeah, so I, I think that would be an opportunity to check out some of those talks, like the, the Breaking Gear and Polish trains. And just jumping back a little bit with the fuzzing for the web. Yeah, I think this thing that they're playing with, with doing the just-in-time uh, instrumentation, is a really cool idea and has a lot of potential for sanitization that wasn't really easy to do before. Because it allows you to do testing on environments that you don't necessarily have the ability to build for because like one of the biggest problems with sanitization is that for the most part uh i mean there is some like black box instrumentation but it's really painful uh for the most part you need the source and to be able to compile and be able to add in instrumentation at that level whereas with what they're working on you can do it kind of after the fact so some of these products that you would be doing bounty research on where you might not have the source code but you do have a binary you can you know, p- perhaps do some sanitization and instrumentation that you couldn't before. And uh, I think that could be useful on the website. So I recommend checking out that talk. So, yeah, that's pretty much everything on CCC. So uh, we'll get into some of our more typical topics. Up first for that, we have a post by Asset Note on analyzing and exploiting two, possibly three, depending on how you want to classify them, vulnerabilities in Pulse Connect Secure which were exploited in the wild, which is kind of what prompted this analysis. And I'll let Z get into it. Yeah, I kind of look at this one as two vulnerabilities that are like actual vulnerabilities in Pulse Connect Secure and all of that. That's the authentication bypass and the remote command execution. And then one bonus issue I'll talk about a bit later. But getting on the actual issue, it's relatively straightforward when you see the actual re- requests here or the example requests for this. And that is just like you see this get API v1 TOTP, blah, 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 and then has the directory traversal in the URL and then like some other endpoint here. And that is because the way Pulse, the way the REST API service works is a REST API service and the actual code was written basically without authentication. All of the endpoints would just work, and the authentication was provided by, um, I 
know they have a Pearl thing, but I think the program itself, right. So there's this like star web service thing that runs the Pearl script and then runs this by the bin web, which is the web binary. Basically, you've got a little server running in front of the actual server. So they'll run the actual service, which doesn't do auth. And then in front of that, they'll have this other web service that's actually connected out to the internet. And that one does the authentication. And so they searched through it. They had found like all the endpoints because they have the source code for the API itself. So they could see like all these endpoints in here. They can go and make requests to them. Only a couple of them work. So they search those strings inside of the binary that's running in front. So you're basically reverse proxy there. It's doing the auth. They find the auth checks. I don't like seeing C directly on the internet. <laughs> Fortunately, this isn't that sort of memory corruption exploit. But basically what's going on here is that they just do a really dumb kind of parsing on the request being made by doing this strn compare, which is effectively because they give it the size of you know whatever size this string is to compare with. Um, it's only going to be checking the prefix of the string or the request URL, sorry, request path coming in. It's just going to say like, if it starts with this and that's where you get that API endpoint we were referencing earlier, if it starts with this API, then it's allowed to go through and they'll pass that request on. If it doesn't start with that or one of the other ones that are allowed, then it will require that they had authentication set up and like have gone through that process. But if they don't, it just passes it on. But when you include that directory traversal in there, it's just going to see that request. Yes, the path starts with the allowed path, so it's okay. They pass it on. And of course, the backend server, probably a little bit better written, not being a random C server, we're not told if this is a library or something custom, but feels a little bit like this is probably something custom on the front end to me. I feel like most systems, most libraries and all that that I've seen will automatically deal with these traversals. They'll look at it um, unless it's something bespoke being written in C or you know, could be something else. But often this is resolved pretty early on in the whole process of routing the request. And so ha having it come through is a little bit surprising. But anyway, what happens is it hits that backend server. Backend server sees that and is like, oh, let's remove these couple directories. And we're actually going here. So it rewrites the request and you get access to all of the endpoints instead of just the couple you're allowed to. It's a very easy kind of or easy to understand issue there. A little bit weird to see it. And in terms of testing this, if you do go try and test it, do not test this using just like Chrome because Chrome or Firefox will automatically do that rewrite and it won't even send the request with the dot dot slash in it. You need to kind of manually make this request in order to actually fire it off just because like that's generally not going to be part of the actual URL. So your browser kind of tries to be helpful and for an attack, that's not actually very helpful. Um, yeah, the issue is fun. It's that's classic prefix issue with whitelisting. It's a little bit weird seeing path reversal on an API in this way. Like you don't typically tend to see it in that sort of way, but. Yeah, the only time I've really seen it was a CTF challenge I did once. And that was slightly different because you still had to encode the slashes. And it was taking advantage of how, like, Flask, you could parse the rest of the URL, and it would resolve the URL encoding. So then when it used that in a file path, you got traverse. So it wasn't this sort of endpoint changing. Because this almost reminded me of, like, the client-side traversal attacks, where you're actually just taking that URL yeah. traversal and taking advantage of it. But in this case, it's because the front end doesn't fully parse the URL before passing it along to the back end. There's and two then, different ways you would classify this issue. You classify it as like a path traversal, but also like a desync type thing. It, it's it's interesting how their setup is. It, it almost seems like intentionally designed to fail. It's, it, it doesn't seem like a great setup, but it makes for a interesting write up. So, yeah, like my guess is this front end server is just like very simply written because it is written in C. You don't want to go too complex when you're not using like a standard web server. Like sure, I mean, Nginx and Apache, I think are both written in C. So it's not like you can't do it 
and I don't know if they use some specific library for this. We don't really have that information. It just feels to me like the sort of thing that took a lot of kind of shortcuts in terms of like, because they're checking the direct request URL rather than seeing what path it would get routed to. And so like it's a system that I would assume doesn't have routing support. And, you know, there's just, I'm making a lot of assumptions about it, but it seems like it would be a more simple system than the actual framework being used for the web. But anyway, so that leads into being able to access all of the endpoints, and then you're left with a command injection, which is just trivial. They, like, did a search for any of the endpoints that use, like, os.system or popen calls, as long as the API made that, and they, in fact, found one that took a node name, which is one of the get parameters, and just pops that right into a popen that uses shell equals true, so right into a shell command line. Puts it right in there, no filtering. So very straightforward command injection. I don't think much time needs to be spent on it. Just easy command injection because they assume this would be an authenticated user doing it. Whereas in this case, they bypass authentication. The bonus issue is really just how they got access to the source code at all. So Pulse Connect Secure, as they call out, like this is behind a paywall effectively. You know, it's behind sales. You have to buy the product in order to actually be using it um, and to get access to anything. They went ahead and they start off just by complaining about that, mentioning that software that's gated behind a sales process can often be more vulnerable simply because it has not had the attention from the security research community, which is a fair point. Uh, not always true. You can make an argument that a company that has their software being paid for has the money then to invest in security. However, many don't. So it's not like, you know, if they have money, they will or anything. And there's a whole argument to be made regarding open versus closed source security that I think we've had the discussion a couple of times, but we're not going to have it today. Um, but for this issue, they basically went with one of the cloud deployments. They mentioned kind of a few ways you can get a cloud deployment of this product. So it will run somewhere. And then they tried to get access to the actual drive on that cloud deployment. And that led to them editing the kernel prompts to try and get uh, just bin sh, change the init process to be bin sh. So the first thing it starts off is just a shell rather than going through its actual init process and starting everything actually up. Turns out that that is kind of blacklisted in the kernel and slash bin sh is not allowed to be done, but, you know, setting init to slash slash bin sh is. So that's the bonus. They got around the blacklist by using another slash in there and, you know, technically not changing the path, but making it so the exact string match won't work. Once they had that, they were able to boot it up with a shell and thus view, view everything and kind of do what they wanted on the machine. So kind of a bonus issue. Not really related exactly to the Pulse Connect Secure software, but it's in this post, so I did at least want to shout that out. It's a bit funny because it's like somebody must have thought about somebody doing this as a vector to get access to like the code. So they were like, okay, let's just make it so they can't edit the parameters to get into a shell, but it was just like a really fast addition that was didn't have a lot of thought or implementation put into it so yeah, it's just or, a really naive check or just assuming that the path is going to be like a result path rather than just an arbitrary string yeah i guess that would be a fair assumption in a case like this yeah so in this case though they were able to use just an arbitrary string so get around it yeah and uh, like you said it's a nice bonus uh, issue that kind of enabled the research on the uh, more critical issues. Yeah, right, it is so, also uh, something to just consider. Like, the web deployments of some of these things may provide you access to software you might have otherwise need to pay for to at least try. Of course, you do end up still kind of paying for running them off the marketplace. Like, they're, they do still get their money, but it's another way of getting software without needing to go through the whole sales process, at least. Yeah, it makes it a bit, a bit more accessible, yeah. potentially. All right, so our next topic is a bit of a rapid fire issue that was disclosed on Hacker One to Hacker One, and it was a pretty sweet logical issue. So, of course, talk about Hacker One. They're dealing with bug reports, and bug reports are going to be hidden until they're agreed 
uh, disclosure, if there is agreed disclosure with the vendor and the researcher, and things like the title are, of course, censored in any listings, since the title can give away quite a lot of information. Um, however, what this researcher discovered was that if there's a pending email invite for collaboration on a particular report, like you can see this sometimes if there's like collision and the vendor will invite somebody else who reported the same thing in or something like that, um, or if you're just working with somebody else, if there's a pending email invite through the managed collaborators invite panel, there's sort of a, like IDOR type issue that opens up in the GraphQL, where if you just send an anonymous GraphQL report query with the report ID of said report, it will give you back the title. It's a pretty cool bug. I can only speculate why this might have happened. My guess is it might be some artifact of like an older insecure flow that exposed the ability to query report titles on reports with open invites. That way, those who were invited could see the title, even if they weren't attached to it at that point. But like I said, I can only speculate on that. But oh, kind yeah, of... I mean, very straightforward issue and it netted them a $7,500 bounty. So very nice. Yeah, decent bounty for it. my guess on it was legitimately that the magic collaborators invitation maybe has a link to hey you got this invite click here and then it comes into hacker one and they may be unauthenticated when they click that and they still want to show the invite and like have a nice view so they just made the title viewable by an anonymous user that simply being what they were going for just even if they click it while not logged in that was kind of my thought on why it might have existed just they wanted that kind of nicer more polished feeling functionality if somebody managed to click it while maybe on their phone and not logged in or something like that and just exposing the title kind of an intentional thing without thinking about the consequences of it oh, could be that was kind of my thought on it and then in that case if they were logged in they just would have privileges to access that report id at that point or to see that title so that was my guess they do call out that this must be through managed collaborator invitations and i guess i should mention two things one i have not been invited onto any reports so i'm not sure what that ui looks like maybe should have actually checked with somebody because i have a bunch of friends who do who do hack on hacker one so probably could have checked into that uh, but yeah they do mention that needs to come through this so i'm not sure if there's another way you could create that invite that then doesn't or wouldn't have had this vulnerability since they call it being must be through there. It sounds like there's probably another way that doesn't do the vulnerability. So that does make me think it is something kind of it intentionally made this decision and made this insecure choice. But yeah, very easy kind of issue. Kind of cool. Report ID does just seem to be, you know, these integer numbers that keep incrementing. So easy enough to kind of brute force for it also. And yeah, fair bounty. Yeah, it's not like a UUID, it's it's enumerable, so it's it's not totally unreasonable for an attacker to be able to like iterate through report IDs to be able to get access to some that they shouldn't otherwise have or something. So Yeah. It is a bit of a tight window. Like, I mean it's not super tight. It's not like a race condition. But since it does require this be a pending invitation, you know, you're still limited to having to get that on the right like day or even hours you know maybe sometimes longer than that but i imagine most invites aren't sitting around that long yeah it would be difficult to target it for like a specific report or a specific product or something but yeah. it, it could still be leveraged on a broader scale yeah i don't think they call out like any indication that this was actually being leveraged yeah we're using the wild because it would be pretty loud and obvious yeah all right, so getting into a, another post, we have four logic bugs reported in an undisclosed application, which is one that provides automated web scraping facilities and multi-login accounts. They describe it as something similar to like incognito mode, but providing hundreds of incognito browsers and having some seamless integration with them. And they're a paid-only service. So these bugs do have a monetary impact. That's where you know the business part of it comes into play. Uh, the first vuln has to do with inviting team members. And this is significant because the plan price in this product in a team plan is going to be based on how many members are in the team. So you get like this base flat rate where you get up to three members. And then after that, it's an additional like 30 euro or something per additional member. The problem was that that member limit threshold was only being updated when a when someone accepted an invite. So if you sent, say, 10 invites and nobody accepted them, you could then go and have all those invites accepted and there'd be no additional charges um, because you were able to get those invites through. 
and it would still just be like the flat rate for the three members. So yeah, like it's only checking it at the time you send the invite. Yeah, so it's sort of like a time of check, time of use issue, but not in the classic like race sense. Uh, it's it's a little bit interesting in that respect. The, uh, yeah, or the you could bug... think of it as it is a race condition. It just has a very long race window. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't really call it much of a race at that point, but yeah, it, it shares some similarities. The second vulnerability is another invitation-based problem. This time, though, it's a bug that allows unpaid or no plan users to invite members, and it's mainly just due to off-checking not really being enforced on the back end, where you can just capture a request that's used for inviting a new user, change out the auth token to a user token with no plan, and the workspace ID, and the request would go through. Uh, the fourth bug is the same sort of issue where invited users can have three roles, a user, a launcher, and a manager, and user roles aren't supposed to be able to see other members or which plan they're on, but they can simply send requests directly to the endpoints, like the workspace restrictions, users, invitations, and the response would contain the information you shouldn't be able to see. So, like, that permission... And that permission model was just based on like the front end. Um, they could still send direct requests to the back end to be able to get that information. The third issue that they talk about was a race when creating a number of browser profiles. And this was more of a classic race condition. So another limitation that they have attached to the plan is the number of browser profiles that you can have. Uh, so like solo accounts, for example, can only create 300 browser profiles. But by sending a bunch of requests simultaneously, you could exceed this limit and add more profiles inside of a window due to the time of check time you use between the time the profile count is updated and when it's checked in the other requests. So, yeah, a lot of these issues were just like flimsy checking where they're relying on the front end too much or just not really considering how people interact with the invites and the fact that... Um, you know, they might not accept them right away. Like, just not considering all of the flows that can happen with billing the user. Yeah, I feel like, especially with the invites, they're kind of coming down to, in part, just trusting the users to do the right thing. And it's just the check is just being performed at the wrong time. It makes sense to do that check for, are there too many users in this group when they're adding a new user to the group? Not at the invite stage where they seem to be doing it, where I do kind of wonder if you could send the invite just using the, or actually, isn't that what the second phone is? Like, yeah, no plan user can invite members. So, I mean, you could probably, even when the limit was reached on the UI, you could probably just make another invite link using the API directly, is the way it sounds. But it just feels like they're doing that check at the wrong place, or they might actually even just be doing a kind of, UI or client-sided only enforcement, which is just like, don't do that. Ever. Well, okay, you can do it, but do it on the back end, too. Sort of a side note that's not really directly attached to the issues. At the top of the post, they talked about the fact that uh, they'd had, like, a personal message from the uh, chief operating officer of the company saying that, like, I love all these vulnerability reports, are different. It shows the guy really knows what he's doing. Please thank him on our behalf. I just wanted to shout that out because that's kind of cool. Like we cover a lot of situations where there's friction between the vendor and researchers and some of the fallout that happens with that. But this is sort of uh, the other side of the coin. So uh, I thought that was worth a bit of a shout out. That actually brings out something I didn't notice. They mentioned here yeah, on one thing. of them. Uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, the the fact that a theory like it seems to be like a crypto product i guess yeah the that fact that it's it? yeah. we will reward you with 500 usd bounty for the report the reward will be sent in crypto so please provide your payment details i didn't notice that this was a i don't know if all of them were paid out in crypto but i would assume that is the case just there aren't many companies that are like oh yeah these bugs will pay out in crypto and these ones are you know paid out in cash so that does change it a little bit i didn't notice that but yeah at the very least, though, I will say, like, crypto companies, for all of the hate they get, tend to at least respect bug bounties. Like, they... Do, they, they tend, tend to be to have, good with that, and from what I've seen, at least. Yeah. yeah, like, I've... It seems like a lot of them do at least... Whether or not the company has a security knowledge, they'll at least respect the fact that security is important, which is kind of lacking on Web2 sometimes. 
But yeah, I, I just didn't notice that before when I came through this. I didn't really read read all of the information in that image. But still, they're, they're fun bugs. There's nothing too crazy here. Things that hopefully you're searching for. But just another case where you kind of see the race conditions uh, pop up. That was the part I liked. I mean, the client side enforcement is kind of meh to see. Like, it is a very basic bug that unfortunately is still around. Yeah, I mean, with the races, we love to say how much we like seeing them, but another thing that we bring up all the time is the fact that they are pretty specific to a scenario. Like, we brought up ones with, like, CTF platforms before and submitting flags, but it's not something you're going to see in every application or in every feature of an application. But something like this, where you're dealing with plans and inviting members into a plan, that's a nice area to look for, and I hadn't necessarily thought of that before for those types of issues. So well, maybe so part of the thing is like the, the traditional race condition is kind of considered on the web. Uh, there's a limit overrun. And so anywhere you have this sort of limit is somewhere you can try and do a race condition, that sort of vulnerability testing on that said the summer reports worker did do the research about smashing the state machine, which was looking at race conditions on a much smaller kind of scope where you kind of have any sort of internal state tracking, like a database update being updated in steps rather than having them as... So when you do database, like you can do a whole transaction where it's like you have a bunch of things going on and a bunch of queries, and then you can roll them back or commit them. If you're not using that and you're just updating this row, updating that row and not doing the transactions, there's room for race conditions in that too. And he started doing research on basically web-based race conditions that aren't just these limit overruns or really obvious situations like that, which is some really cool research also that is trying to push what we're doing with race conditions and what type of issues you can actually try and hunt for beyond this sort of traditional and usual route. And right. actually, I'm just going to pull up the, just going to add the link in. Uh, oh, it's the Ports for your post? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. I've got the link here for Port Swigger's post about it, although this was also a DEF CON presentation that's worth, but going into kind of some techniques we're doing in, it says beyond limit overrun exploits, because he ended up having some, I think he actually mentions a bug that we talked about that was brought up in one of the posts we were talking about just in passing, like we had this really weird scenario and it turned out it was being caused by this sort of race condition where the database would change before like an email was sent or something. I forget the exact details in part because it's been a little while since I read over what was all brought up in here or his talk. And the other part was I never bothered looking up what, when we actually talked about the bug that brought that up in passing. So whatever on that front but yeah at least we've got this link in there for you guys if you want to see a bit more about like a newer way of looking for race window or race conditions so getting into our next topic we have a advisory on next cloud so unfortunately for those who are like watching and like to follow the links uh there really isn't a lot of information on this advisory that's a very generic one, but Z had went through and uh, dug through some of the commit history and whatnot and was able to figure out what the problem was, so I'll let him get into it. Yeah, or at least what I believe is the problem. There is a chance that this isn't quite it, or that I don't have the exact understanding of it, because there is one part of this where I'm not sure where it's coming from or how exactly this works, but this was a commit made that seems very relevant and is at the right time and that is this auth check on slave and what seems to be happening here if i understand this code correctly or the important part is this line 81 or 181 through 185 and these few lines and what happens here is or this stood out to me initially at least because it goes if not empty password result equals user session login Passing in the UID and password. L, so if the password is empty, result equals true. So it kind of just comes through as if they have a password, then... Like a fail open sort of issue. Yeah. 
Um, um, and that just to said, clarify, this isn't a create app token function. I don't think we talked about the function, but it's it's it seems to be relevant for like uh, authentication. So that's that's where its impact is. Yeah. So with the app token, that's where I'm a little bit unclear on exactly how you're reaching this code. This does seem to be the code relevant to this commit. Actually, if I go back to this. Yeah, this is the pull request for it. So like it is the relevant code. But yeah, so I'm not sure exactly how you're reaching here. And the reason why that kind of matters, at least in my mind, is because it is using a JWT to get the UID, password, and options values. So that is coming from somewhere. But given that it is at least the password, that should be attacker control. Like that should be coming in from somewhere that the attacker does control in this request because it's not like it's just going to inject the proper password or something. So there should be some degree of control over these values. It's not just a, yeah, it based, basically it's not just a like JWT that they have no control over. This does seem to have some input from the user and their actual like requests or something in there. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure exactly where that's, what the flow is to reach this. I, but you do end up with this case of, and actually, I'm going to change views here, which I forgot GitHub changed where they uh, let you change between unified and split. But if you look on the left hand side for the vulnerable code, if they do the empty check and if result is true, you have the, you know, it generates the app token and carries on, seeming like that is the success route. And you now have the app token to like use on the application or however that process actually works. What was going on here, what their thought process probably was, was that if a request comes in and it's going to use SAML, that means somebody else is going to actually validate the user and you're just going to go through the whole SAML process and validate that the user kind of did their thing and get uh, some information back about the user there. So their thinking was probably, if they come here with an empty password, then they probably would have hit this code up here, which, you know, if the user doesn't exist or it's wrong or something, that's probably going to throw in a throw an exception and they won't end up in this code because or, you know, the user ID that they get back just won't exist. Like it'll be a null or something. So they're probably thinking like, OK, they're going to be a SAML request. And if, if we get a SAML request in here, they don't have a password, so we don't verify it. But they don't actually validate that it is a SAML request before they set it to true. And because of that, somebody could make the request here that isn't going through SAML and is instead just like their normal password flow. But without a password, thereby letting people just log in without a password through, you know, however this code is reached. And the patch is effectively changing that. If the password is empty, they use whatever the value of SAML is, so if they got SAML or not, as the backend option. So if you do end up skipping that process, the SAML won't work out and it'll just be result false, or otherwise they'll use the actual login process. So they fix it by that. Thus, I'd have to conclude that, you know, this is working more or less how I understand it, even though I don't know the entire flow of this code. But yeah, kind of interesting to see that in an auth-related auth area. And I think to me, like reading the code, this whole if not empty password and result setting, that is what stood out to me. Like first and foremost is like something is not right here. Obviously, I know there's an auth issue, but just that code, you know, should get bells ringing. Like, is there any way to get through here in an unexpected way or with an empty password? It's funny how prevalent empty passwords seem to be in being able to bypass auth checks. <laughs> it's something that you would <laughs> think would be, be like very, it shouldn't be. Yeah, you would think it would be something that would be like a solved problem for, for the most part, but it's not. So well, yeah. it feels like this it was a solved problem when everybody was just hashing their passwords. You know, for that little period before we went SSO and started having more complex things to consider, that little tiny period where it's just like, yeah, you hash and you're selling your password, which by the way, like today you should be doing like key derivation function and not just hash and salt. But for that time where hash and salt was the primary thing to do, it felt like then it was almost a solved issue because you would hash your password before doing anything with it. So it would never be empty. If it was empty, it would just be a hash of the empty password. 
Um, and yeah. so you did have that edge case. But yeah, it, it's... Now that you mention it, it is kind of weird to see it so often being used as this edge case to check on and leading to issues. Yeah, and it feels like recently especially we've seen it a lot, so... That's why my password is just spaces. Ah, that's uh, <laughs> that's the big brain take right there. Two hundred. What happens when humans use one hundred percent of their brain? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But yeah, nice, nice bug. The code I think really makes it obvious. But you know, if you're testing, odds are you know maybe there's some JavaScript there preventing you from entering like a blank thing, or that maybe this isn't entered from like the usual login flow because this is a create app token, so. Could be something like that, making it a less hit or less examined area, too. But, I mean, given, actually, while I'm talking about, I do wonder. Oh, I can't get a blame for this. Oh, you're going to get a get blame, see if you can figure out, like. Yeah, I'm just curious how context. old that code was. Yeah. Yeah. And I can do it from the other page here if I can find. The appropriate so, line side here. note, like I, I've, I've been having like GitHub has done this thing where they've been changing their UI for like the past few years, and I swear to God, like every time I go to GitHub and I try to find something, I can't. <laughs> I feel like it's gotten more annoying to use as time goes on. It but, has. Sorry, like, go ahead. They've they've changed their UI in ways that I really don't like. Um, yeah. But it looks like this specific code comes back to October of 2018. Where the commit is just like, if we have a password, we verify it, which is, you know, the commit we were just looking at. So I probably could have gotten that commit page from the page we were actually on. No, no, because I was looking at the push. Never mind. Like the newer, newer one. But I was looking at the older code. Because, yeah, it looks like before that, they just did if user exists. So they must have had auth somewhere else. More recent yeah, than so I thought that, the code might be, though. Uh, comes from 2018 so it's been around for like a fair number of years you know that's still like i guess 2018 years? was a while ago now yeah <laughs> yeah like, like it that's, hasn't been but it has been i guess five years i give it since yeah. we're early on 2024 but but yeah it's you know it's been around for a little while which is fair because i mean Nextcloud does seem to have a pretty active hacker one and that's where i first got this phone from was off hacker one so like, they do seem to have a pretty active thing there, so it is a little bit surprising, actually, to see it last that long. It's possible maybe they made some changes to JWTs and stuff like that also, but... Well, like um, you said, it's probably just in, like, an offflow that's not as common and just not as looked at, so... All right, so getting into some normalization-based issues. From Jerry Shaw, we have an IDN homograph attack, IDN being internationalized domain name, which... Uh, can allow domain names to include non-ASCII characters, things like uh, accented A, for example, like characters you'd see in French and whatnot. Um, it allows those to be in domain names, and that's where the homographic attack comes from, using lookalike characters. And that can be used, in this case, to end up tricking users into clicking links to direct them to malicious password resets. So this is in a private, undisclosed app, but what ended up happening was uh, they used X forwarded host headers on the password reset page for building the link for password reset. And when the researcher tried changing this to some attacker controlled domain like evil.com, the request was rejected. So it seems like they have some sort of checking on the forwarded host. So like even though they used it for building the domain that's used in the email, they do check it to make sure it's not something that, you know, might be a malicious domain. However, if they use the same like domain name as the target one, but they swapped a character for a non-ASCII one, so like an A for an accented A, it would go through, it would pass their check due to whatever normalization is going on there. But the problem is like that raw X forwarded host value is what is used for the link that's actually sent in the password reset email. And so if a victim clicked that link, it would take them to the attacker site, not the original domain, which since that URL would contain a reset token, would leak that token and allow for account takeover. So yeah, it's sort of interesting and it is it does have sort of a phishing aspect to it. Although to be fair, the email would be coming from like the legitimate target. So it would seem like sort of a legitimate request there and you could still get got, especially because uh 
a lot of password reset emails, like they won't display the link directly, right? They'll embed the link around like a button or whatever. There'll be HTML emails. So especially in cases like that, like this definitely could be abused. And yeah, it's an interesting way to leverage the homograph attack style. So yeah, it's it's actually a situation I really wouldn't have expected it to exist in. And it stood out to me because of that. Because, like, I'm aware of the homograph style attacks and doing this thing. Like, it happens with any time you're dealing with the normalized URLs and stuff. Like, they can happen. It's just, with the host, it feels like, you know, it's doing the validation, so it feels like it knows what the host is. Like, it, you know, so why doesn't it just use the good, safe string that it knows? Presumably, they do allow multiple domains. Like, maybe they allow any subdomain of target to be used, and they just don't try to lock it into the specific host but it then also feels weird just what type normalization they're doing and who's doing the normalization because this isn't like in python like there is a capital accented a like this or so like if it's just doing like a two uppercase or two lowercase i don't think that's actually going to normalize the accent away and if it's something like a library for validating the url you'd expect it to actually convert it right down to the IDN name, which is going to have like that XN dash dash for like the characters in there or for the special characters in there. So then that wouldn't compare. So they're doing some sort of transformation here that doesn't make sense in the context. Like they're doing it. Obviously, he got the bug. I'm not denying that. It just it feels like a little bit of a weird area for to find this sort of issue in. Although, you know, anywhere where you've got the URLs to somewhere you can take advantage of this. So it is worth kind of testing for. Just need to see it here, and I think it's a nice little attack. It does require that user interaction, as Spectre was mentioning. Somebody getting a random password reset. I don't know. Personally, I wouldn't really be too keen to click on it if I didn't, if, if I wasn't the source it. of that. Yeah, yeah, and I do appreciate something Facebook actually does on that front is on those emails they also have a link that's like if you did not request this, visit like this and let us know or whatever. Of course, you also would have uh, this vulnerability would probably or this style of vulnerability would also probably impact the link created for that. Or maybe it wouldn't <laughs> actually because it would want to use more of a rooted domain like it knows where it wants to send it. It's not a random or it's not being based off of anything relative. So maybe not. But I do appreciate kind of them having that as an option as a way to respond rather than just ignoring them. Uh, presumably they take some other action based off of that. I'm not actually sure what the whole flow is there. Because generally, if I get an unsolicited email, I'm just going to delete it or not, you know, especially not click on links from it. But I do remember seeing that on one and thought it was at least a nice potential step, as long as that itself is not getting corrupted. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, like if you don't initiate it, you are supposed to be somewhat skeptical but people do have lapses on that i feel like i've almost done it once before i didn't do it but i i'd like caught myself where i just wasn't thinking clearly and like i could see like the email was coming from the verified host or whatever like i said it has that phishing aspect to it but it is interesting that it's able to subvert the link in a legitimate email instead of being the more classic phishing where it's you know domain spoofing or something yeah, like being yeah. able to mess with that link. This is a classic when you have that host header injection attack. Like this is the classic way you take advantage of that is the email being sent. I think that's one of the primary ways you'll see host header injections being used or being being exploited is through that. This extra authentication there, though, just it makes sense. But it also like I don't I can't quite imagine what they're doing. You can't quite rationalize it. Yeah. Yeah. Like it is, it's probably something like a library being used here that's doing that normalization. They're passing it in, it gets normalized. That does remind me of one other aspect, though, is like where normalization gets performed. I feel like you don't want to pass in or like have normalization being performed too deeply in code. My personal philosophy on that is like if you have normalization being performed really deep inside the code, like right before just this one validation routine and not elsewhere. What you can end up happen, ha, what can end up happening is that the valid thing that gets validated doesn't match the thing that's actually being used. Like in this case, it's validating something else and using another value. So I'd rather see 
like normalization being performed either centrally, like just a central normalized domain sort of function call, which won't always work when it's like a library doing it, but having it like that or just having it kind of early on before the thing is called, like the library could say it should be called with like this normalization performed, always lowercase or something like that. That way you hold the value that actually gets validated and it doesn't do any transformations on the data before validating it. That's not always practical, but just in my personal like development philosophy, I'd like to see like the value that gets validated should not get modified from what was passed in unless like necessary. There are cases where you only validate part of the data or whatever. It's just one of those things that you can introduce a lot of bugs when the validation happens when normalization happens deeper than the actual validation call. So you can maybe take advantage of some of the changes there, like they do in these sorts of cases, in, in exploiting these sorts of bugs. All right, so we do have yet another uh, insecure direct object reference in this episode with another Hacker One report. This one being the Perfume Shop, which, as the name implies, is a storefront where you can place orders. The problem here is if someone can guess or exfil your order ID, uh, they can send a request directly to this register for order endpoint. Presumably, uh, I did check quickly through the site, you can place an order and then register like after the fact, so presumably this is for that. And because of that, it's accessible to guests that aren't logged in and lets you register an account on an order. And if you put some email in there that's not registered, when that request goes through, it'll create the account, and that order ID that you pass will be attached to the attacker-created account. and they'll be able to access like a bunch of personal information of the victim, including their address, their phone number, other orders, and even saved payment details if they're there. So yeah, sort of your classic IDOR issue, though the impact here is fairly substantial and that's why it netted the $5,000 bounty. So yeah, I mean, pretty quick one. It is kind of IDOR. It feels like, I mean, with classic IDOR, I think of just ID equals something and accessing the object directly. Whereas this is kind of a, indirect object reference because it is it's using the object id to do something else and you're not accessing the file directly but i you do have that see they step. Yeah. yeah i do see they call this like the weakness on this one i door so fair enough like i mean that's just getting nitpicky anyhow like i see the connection i thought this was a cool bug though because, yeah taking the order id and it just gets associated with your account as though the developers just assume you know if they gave you the order id that must be their order. And so all that information gets disclosed if that wasn't, in fact, your order. I thought it was just fun on that fact and just kind of where this happens and the step that's kind of happening for this to happen. And once again, this looks like it's just integers for the actual order ID. They give the example of like just a... I can't, I can't count here. Is that nine-digit number? I believe it's yeah nine, nine digits yeah. um like just a nine digit number so like you probably have a hard time doing this on like a targeted basis but just doing that with a bunch of accounts and leaking a bunch of PII absolutely you know a good impact out of that when you're getting and like, that is typically how those uh, attacks go so yeah and being like a perfume perfume shop people are probably you know ordering things their home address you're getting plenty of information. Should somebody want to maliciously use that, feels like they could get a reasonable chunk of info. They do call out the payment information, although with payment information, they should not be getting access to like full credit card numbers. That should be limited to just like the last four. You would know, hope for at least. Well, because that's all the whole like PCI or not, not PCI. Oh, um, PCI. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh, what is that? Well, I guess payment card industry, so maybe it is PCI, but there's the whole certification for for payment cards or like the whole standard and like audits happen and all of that on those standards. So like So it's a reasonable assumption they're being followed, is what you're saying. Yes. Reasonable yeah. assumption that they are not storing just your like credit card number and basically if that came out in this the $5,000 bounty is not enough if they actually got credit card numbers. Yeah, but as you said, like, address information and everything is quite a lot, too. So, yeah, definitely, like, no questions on the impact. So the next disclosure is a really fun issue. It's probably my favorite issue of the episode. 
and it's a timing attack on dark HTTPD. So I'll let Z get into it. Yeah, timing attack and pretty simple. I've never heard of dark HTTPD, so I doubt it's like being used really widely. It looks like it's another C web server, which we're just talking about a bit ago. <laughs> I don't like seeing C used that way, but what they've got is effectively the HTTP all system. So like handling when you just send like, I think it goes base 64 where you send like your password username in the authorized header in base 64, that whole system in order to compare the credentials simply uses a standard STR CMP. So string compare function, which will return as soon as there's a difference between the two strings and say, nope, they're not the same. And so the problem with that is that that is vulnerable to a timing attack. You know, if it does the loop, say through two characters, so you get like the first two characters correct and then the rest are wrong, that's going to take a shorter amount of time than if you provide like the valid credentials and like a 16 character password. And so because there's that timing difference, you can then make like a request and see like, here's how long this takes and find the request that takes a little bit longer because it did one more iteration and all of that. And you can keep repeating that character by character to brute force the password. That's generally how timing attacks work. And while I'm saying this as like, you just do that, realistically over to the internet this is very difficult to pull off in a lot of cases um you're going to you be have to left account for drift and things it's it's a lot less deterministic than like on a local system yeah you've just got network jitter you've just got all these things going on on the internet that are going to impact the time beyond just the milliseconds that we're talking about for a difference in a iteration like this where it's comparing just two characters in a string like it's a very small small bit of time that you're trying to detect so usually pulling off timing attacks on the internet mean you're making like tens if not hundreds of thousands of requests to actually get that sort of timing and still possibly not getting it but with that i kind of want to use this post like th the bug itself is kind of fun it's a timing attack it's on the web or on a web server so it's kind of cool it isn't something we talk about every day but it is something you should at least be thinking of trying to catch. I wouldn't look at too many login systems because you've usually got hashing and all that involved there too. This sort of HTTP auth in particular could be vulnerable to this because it is using the plain text. But I want to bring this up more as a chance to talk about a paper that came out, I believe in 2020, which was called a timeless timing attacks. And actually that race conditioned paper that I brought up or not paper presentation port swigger that I mentioned, they actually mentioned something that this attack does, but what they do in this paper or this presentation and paper, if I recall correctly, the presentation actually does a pretty good job of talking about this, but they kind of changed the idea to not measuring the actual explicit timing of a request and instead looking at relative timing. So if you can find two requests, one that is consistently faster or slower than the other, and using basically information about which one finished faster as your basis of your timing attack, rather than measuring these specific speeds. And that kind of changes how granular you can know, because even if it's like 10 milliseconds faster, you're still able to detect that, even if you wouldn't necessarily get that exact timing information. And what it does depend on having HTTP2 because it relies on, I forget the technical term for it, but the idea of sending like in a single packet, you can with HTTP2, some implementation stream connections, right? Um, well, you can send like uh, two different requests at the same time. I want to say it's multiplexing where you can send like two separate requests at the same time. So you'd send them in the same packet and thus they arrive at the same time but you can determine whether which one finished faster based on the response timing. That's the base of the attack. It does have that requirement on HTTP2. It doesn't necessarily play well with like a front end server, like Cloudflare stripping everything and then communicating with the back end server. So there are limits to it. Although even there, it does decrease a lot of the jitter between because Cloudflare and whatever data center, your actual service is going to be and it's going to have a better connection than like the internet so it even if it's not perfect you still just make it can bring down the request to like thousands of requests instead of 
hundreds of thousands of requests, uh, something a lot more practical to kind of pull off. And I think it's just an interesting idea to take the timing attacks that way. So I wanted to shout it out as something to kind of keep an eye on for with these timing attacks because they're classic timing attacks. One, I don't think a lot of people are really thinking about timing attacks because they aren't a popular attack and they have been so difficult to pull off. But I do feel like this timing attack research is kind of not been considered enough or maybe there just aren't enough days to do timing attacks. But I did want to shout it out. Or shout out this vulnerability mostly as a way to bring up that paper and that style of attack. They do have some other things in this post, but that's beyond what I actually want to talk about. I'm just focusing on this basic auth timing attack. Yeah, I mean, the reason that I love this is specifically, I don't think timing attacks are thought about in web very much. Like if you're thinking about, if you're looking at low level firmware and things and passwords there, like side channels are considered as part of the security model fairly regularly. That's something that people are thinking about. You're not really thinking about side channels on the web. It's just not a case you run into super often. So when you do see it, it's like, oh yeah, like that, that, that is something you need to think about. And it's, it's cool too, because uh, I mean, for, for an, from an attacker perspective, maybe not so much for the, you know, developer, but like, there's nothing inherently wrong with using stir comp for, doing a compare like that's what you're that's what you would expect to do it's intuitive they are comparing the password and everything you just don't really consider that that's leaky in terms of time like you, this the side channel part of it it's not an exp like vulnerability that screams out at you when you're reading the code no and like, like you said in many cases it's not an issue anyway because you have the hashing and the, and the comparison like there's things that are obfuscating the uh, well, just eliminating that side channel entirely. But in certain cases, like HTTP auth, where it's more basic, it can be a problem. Yeah, and yeah. that's kind of a thing with side channels is not only do you have to do the right calculation and do like the right thing, and they are, they're doing the right thing. They're comparing the values. They're doing it right, but they also have to do it the right way. It's not just, I read something where it's like, not only do you have to do it right, you have to use the right color pen or something like that. Like, just like the level of technically correct you have to be throughout to prevent the side channels. That's just kind of like the problem with side channels is it, it's not obvious in code unless you're really thinking about them. Yeah, it's abusing things that aren't intuitive. Like, that's the whole attack class, right? Yeah, it's the so, side effects of what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool to see that on the web, the few and far between times that you do see it. Yeah. And getting into a little bit more classical password issues, we have our last post by Positive Security on ransacking password tokens. I'll let Z get into it, and then we'll go into our show notes. Yeah, kind of classic, kind of. I mean, there are some novelties with this, but they're le they're able to leak tokens off a database. And what it it's more of a research rather than a specific vulnerability, although they did find this to be vulnerable in a particular area or on a specific application. What they're kind of warning about is the use of this ransack library, which is used on Rails or Ruby applications, specifically usually with Rails. And the idea is, you know, you have your active records or a database set up, you know, your objects representing your record in the database. And then what Ransack provides is just this kind of nice way you'll have like your set of posts and you'll Ransack that post with your search parameter. And your search parameter could be like whatever field of the post you actually want to cover. So they have the example here. If you want to search all of the titles for anything containing a value. You would send in like title underscore con underscore con being the predicate for contains. And so they would just take like the query. They're using the letter Q for that variable, but they would take the query variable right from the user and then uh, use that right into post ransack. And the problem being that ransack provides a lot of very powerful predicates that you can use to do your search. They have the contains, but they also like you search by starts with and ends with. And not just do they like you do that, but you're also you know, you're specifying the field itself to search. So sure, you want to search the title. That makes sense. But in the case like the user example, or sorry, the example they have here, the post example that has the title, that has content or 
pre I'm not sure what presence would be in this. I guess that might that might just be, oh that's probably just relayed to the validates itself. That's just saying like validate that it's there, but kind of indicating a couple of the fields that exist there as being title and content. But also, it has a user field. So not only could he search for you, or not only could he search for title, but you could search for the user and that the username has an email that starts with something. And you can start navigating all of the objects a little bit and querying for other things. So what they found are if you, so one is the problem with using like underscore start, that start predicate or end, is you can start doing a character by character brute force on the basis of, if you have a character in there, or if you don't get any results with one character, try with another character if you get no results, and you can kind of just work there where you get results on one, and then you add a second character and you see what gives you results, and just working through like that. Similar kind of to like if you're doing a like blind sequel attacks, oftentimes they'll use this sort of technique where you brute force character by character to try and get your match. And yeah, so they end up finding this in fablabs.io, where you would have like your lab that you could search, which makes sense. You would search, you know, the lab by like a country code or activity status. Uh, and those searches, of course, make sense. But because you could access those other classes also, you could go and query for the user and their role and then look if they're a super admin. So like when they do the creator of the lab, the role, the name contains super admin, and you're just able to kind of query deeply there. And then they start querying into the recoveries and their recovery keys. In this example one here, they're looking for it to start with zero, but you can kind of repeat this to leak a recovery key of a super admin or a user with super admin in their name. Presumably, you know, the first one there would be the super admin, but um, you can kind of use that information. So just kind of a dangerous feature of this general search thing and just search operators in general and these sort of really generic libraries can be really nice because they implement this functionality really easily for you but they can also be a bit of a pain on the security front because they try or they just support so much generic usage that they don't consider that there could be the security constraints uh, thankfully, Ransack has upgrade to 4.0, which does limit some of what you could do by default there. They enforce the use of explicit allow lists for searchable attributes, which is a good step. But this is something to keep in mind when you come across these sort of search interfaces. If you do see field names being included there, like give a try with something else. Dot notation is pretty common as another way of getting access to other fields because this is relatively common to be able to do ideally not being able to access like other objects, but we've seen it a ton of times where you can get into other objects. And if you can do that, there's almost always some danger in that functionality in general, unless it's being whitelisted because there's just so many fields that you can potentially get access to in most object oriented languages. All right, so that's all the topics that we have for today. We do have some shout outs, starting out with a Worse Than Solar Winds uh, blog post. Um, yeah. This is the shout out, so I'll let him talk through it here. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the novelty here is really just, or really just the recognition, at least to me, is that when you make a commit on a project, you become on GitHub, it is now considering you to be a contributor to that project. And that by default does provide you with a few extra privileges, such as being able to have the GitHub runners um, run kind of more automatically based off of the fact that like you made the PR, the commit or whatever. And so they kind of start here with an attack where you would take over one of the self-hosted GitHub runners and just shell that and then get access to uh, sensitive information. And your first step is to just find a typo and correct that. So that's kind of thing they're adding on there. It's like, yeah, you go, you fix this little commit, do that little thing. And then you can actually do some damage from there, potentially do some damage um, and kind of take over some of the builders and all of that. Or, well, not really wanting to take over the builder. You're wanting to leak the information out from there. Some of the secrets that may have access to and such. So there are three steps are find a typo, shell the runner and then own everything 
because those runners may have access to whatever. It's just kind of the novelty is that first step. So we didn't want to cover this as like a whole post and a whole thing because we've seen these sort of runner takeovers multiple times. And it's worth noting, too, that this would be specific runners. Like, it wouldn't be GitHub-hosted ones. It would have to be self-hosted ones, which that's going to depend a bit on the context, right? Uh, yeah. A lot of the times, like, I was talking a little bit with Z before the show about it, but, like, GitHub's uh, hosted runners are generally pretty good and are pretty lenient with their resource restrictions. So I think it's, like, rarer and rarer as time goes on to find, like, self-hosted runners because it's just kind of a pain that, most people just don't want to deal with uh and it is like more of a security concern as demonstrated here so yeah so i mean it is worth noting it is kind of this avenue of attack there but because we've seen this sort of thing a number of times didn't think it was worth the full topic yeah another shout out that we have is this crypto gotchas post uh, a collection of common cryptographic mistakes and learning resources I really appreciated this post because something that we talk about every now and again is the fact that crypto is hard. You know, everyone's heard the phrase, don't roll your own crypto. And this post is like a great illustration of why you shouldn't. It kind of shows all of the nuances that can that you have to consider when you're talking about these different algorithms. So for example, they talk about like how difficult RSA, like secure RSA keys actually are to generate. And a lot of the time when you're thinking about RSA, like you know that you have to keep the private key private, but actually generating that key, there's a lot of nuances that go into that. And you wouldn't be aware of them necessarily unless you had uh, like ran into problems with it before, or you would like meticulously read the specifications and the white papers. Uh, so this post goes into a lot of the like common pitfalls you can run into with certain algorithms or even just using certain algorithms in general. Um, yeah, it's just got a lot of really cool information. Some of it can be difficult to follow if you're not super into crypto and the terminology. But yeah, it's just an interesting read. It is still fairly accessible as far as like encryption stuff goes. And if you're deploying something where you have to consider crypto as part of your security model, I think this post will have some information that's relevant. Yeah, and I think it can give some insight for like the bug bounty hunting on some crypto things. Some of these things are going to be things that you might more spot in code rather than being able to spot it from the outset. But it is a good list of more technical crypto problems rather than just like the basics of like, you know, encryption, it's called it at the start there, but like encryption doesn't imply integrity of the data. It's just encrypted. There's more going on. There. There's a lot of things here. I learned some things out of this, actually. Um, and they do call out some more general issues, too, like certificate validation, calling out stuff like the things to consider for wildcards, whatever. And that's more dealing, that's like, you know, verifying your Crypto certificate needs to apply to the right place, but some things aren't valid. They even call out the internationalized domains, which we were kind of talking about earlier. But yeah, there's just a lot in here. Some of it may be practical, some of it may not. I think it's worth going over if you do have some basic foundation in crypto, because this definitely does not teach you crypto. It's just, here's some issues, or here's some common gotchas that could be made, which, of course, developers are going to make them. I'm mean, everybody's going to make them really, but you know, you're going to be able to find some of those and maybe find a impact for a bounty. And we do have a few more shout outs as well. So uh, we have a port swigger post on LLM attacks or large language models. Something that we've talked about a little bit in the past. Uh, we used to talk about like uh, deep neural networks and things like that, but it is like a pretty specific area of security research and it is somewhat outside of Z and I's field. So that's part of why we didn't cover it as a full topic, but it is an emerging security field that is going to become more and more relevant and important as time goes on. So it, it definitely is something that's worth checking out. I think if you're in the bounty space and you know, it's, it's from Port Swigger and their web security Academy. Yeah. Those that's who the main to thing. Us for a while are aware of our opinions on Port Swigger. Like their, their stuff's really solid. So that's actually the main thing here is that I just wanted to announce that Port Swigger added like LM. So it is a bit different than the AI stuff we used to talk about. It is specifically about the large language models, which with ChatGPT has exploded. Everybody's kind of aware of that. But they've added LLM practice labs on here. 
to actually go and, you know, do some practice exploiting some of the APIs and trying to make it do things that it shouldn't. They go through a few things here, a uh, few potential issues and have their, you know, their lab, their expert lab here on like exploiting insecure output handling in LM. So take advantage of the output rather than try and make it do something, have it output incorrect or not necessarily incorrectly, but like XSS or something. I haven't looked at the labs. So I'm not sure which route it goes. They go over quite a few issues there. So I kind of want to call it that these labs are there and could be fun to play around with. And it kind of ties in actually to the next shout out that we have here, which is improving LM security against prompt injection, app set guidance for pen testers and development or for, and developers. And I honestly feel like I was talking about this during the prep stream, but I feel like this is kind of a losing battle. Like LLMs, they don't think, but like you kind of have to recognize that even if you give them these instructions, there's still kind of going to be people who can maybe talk, talk the right words and sweet talk the AI into doing something else. It you know, the classic insecure, basically. It feels like the wrong layer to be trying to prevent this at. It feels like there needs to be something at the LLM layer that's able to give it like these really enforceable rules rather than just a system instruction. That's kind of where, yeah, you know, it just feels like the wrong layer for this to be fixed at is what I'm getting at. And so trying to fix it there feels wrong, but it is still important because it is the only option we really have right now. We don't have these other options. I just feel like in the future, it should be done elsewhere. But yeah, he's mostly talking, or a lot of this is about writing those system prompts to minimize the risk of prompt injection. Doesn't promise that there won't be any prompt injection, just here are considerations. And I think it's also really useful for learning some of the attack options from it as he goes through all these things and you kind of see the back and forth. I think there's just some potential insight there. That could be valuable, especially as we probably will see more applications using LLMs or integrating them in some way. And then the last two shout outs that I have are both focused on Kubernetes. One here, Sysol from Orca Security, is more just pointing out like a common misconfiguration or, and misunderstanding about what this system authenticated group is. And because that simply means that they are like authenticated on Google. So it's like any Google OIDC account, um, like anybody can be that. It doesn't have anything to do with your actual like rules within your organization or anything. And so that can sometimes be misused and can potentially give you an avenue of uh, escalation. And the second post here, Kubernetes scheduling and secure design really just has a lot of background that I thought could be interesting. Somebody who is looking at some of these like Kubernetes breakouts ends up in a Kubernetes situation where they want to break out or want to escalate from it. Just has a lot of information there. While background obviously focus on like the scheduling and stuff, but figured it was worth at least like a shout out here. I haven't actually read through all of it, I'll admit. Um, but I did kind of take a look there. It looks like there's a lot of valuable information here if you're going to be doing some work in that area and that all right. is all of the shout outs i think i have yeah so we had quite a few to get through because you know like i said at the top of the episode we we stacked topics between a few weeks so that's probably the most shout outs that i can remember in recent memory uh for like this is probably the most topics we've covered in a single episode since we used to have our monolithic episodes before we split them up so yeah, it was a bit of a trip down memory lane, but that is all the topics that we have for today. So, as always, thanks goes out to everyone who tuned in. Previous episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Feel free to join the community by joining our Discord. So, the links for that are down below in the description. And we'll see you in the next one.